This cassette contains a series of six messages which Brother Freeman has recorded for the purpose of broadcasting on radio. Due to the importance of these messages, we're making this cassette available on Brother Freeman's regular tape list. I want to begin in today's broadcast a series of studies concerning a great error Actually, I believe a heresy that's being propagated, especially among charismatic Christians today, and it's based upon 2 Corinthians 5.21, where we read in the King James, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And the contention is, by these teachers of the error that we will deal with, the contention is that he literally became sin, actually a sinner on the cross made sin by God. Now, this is contrary to the teaching of the entire Bible, both the Old Testament type and the New Testament. And so I'm going to be dealing with a subject from one of my books entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually?, I'll be dealing with the subject in the next several broadcasts from that book, which is available to you from the book and tape list. It's entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? And of course, even though thousands and thousands of copies of this book are going out, nevertheless, there are some people who will never get the book, who need to know the truth. And of course, this will be for the benefit of those who, for whatever reason or another, do not read or read very much. So we want to deal with what is entitled the JDS heresy. Those initials stand for Jesus died spiritually. That's what the teachers of this era say. We're going to be exposing the false doctrine that Jesus died spiritually. The question under consideration in these studies, did Jesus actually become sin at Calvary and experience spiritual death, not just physical Well, the teachers of the JDS heresy insist that he did, whereas God's word states repeatedly that his death was physical, like the Old Testament type. And we are redeemed, according to Hebrews 10.10, through the offering of the body of Jesus. As we will show you again and again, it is said that Jesus offered his body on our behalf. That is, he gave up his life in death as a substitute. Now, several years ago, when this doctrine first began to be stressed by certain charismatic teachers, I then designated this error for the sake of brevity as the JDS doctrine, standing those initials for Jesus died spiritually, as these erroneous teachers tell us. Therefore, it's going to be referred to as the JDS error. So you'll know what is meant by those initials. Now, did Jesus literally become sin on the cross, as the JDS teachers tell us, or was he a sin offering? Are you aware that the Bible clearly shows that Jesus was a sin offering, holy and pure, just as the Old Testament type foreshadowed? And the King James translators would have done better to have translated 2 Corinthians 5.21 as sin offering instead of sin, as we will show. Did Jesus go to hell for three days where he was united in spirit with Satan, who became his master? Well, the JDS teachers tell us that he became one in spirit with Satan, took on his evil nature. The Bible, however, states that at death Jesus went to be with his heavenly Father, not to be with Satan down in the pit. Because as he died, remember, after he said, It is finished, then he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23 and verse 46. Did Jesus redeem man in hell or on the cross? Are you aware that the advocates of the JDS doctrine teach that redemption was accomplished in the pit? Jesus, however, contradicts this error with his own words from the cross, which indicate that he had completed his redemptive work there, for he said, It is finished. Now, whatever deluded men may say to the contrary, these three words stand as a permanent rebuke to the JDS error that teaches that Jesus died spiritually and redeemed man in hell. Did the sinless Son of God, as the JDS teachers tell us, become unregenerate and lost at Calvary? Was he a lost man like all sinners are? Did he have to be born again and justified from sin in the pit as they teach? The JDS position on this matter indicates the enormity of their delusion, 
For they tell us again and again that the sinless Son of God was lost on the cross, had to be born again, and in hell of all places. How can you be born again in hell? Not only is such teaching heresy, but we also find that the JDS doctrine does not solve the problem of the redemption of sinners. It only creates a new problem. If Jesus became a sinner, then who died for Jesus to redeem him from his unregenerate state and provide for his justification? Who provided an atonement for Jesus if he literally became sinful with sinful humanity? Don't you see how ridiculous that is? It doesn't even follow religious or scriptural logic. Did the blood of Jesus atone for sin? Well, this is the central purpose for the sacrificial shedding of blood in Scripture. But here once more, the JDS teaching is seen to be totally out of harmony with the Word of God, although it is in line with the teaching of the religious cults and of liberalism. One of the leading proponents of the JDS heresy states, when his blood was poured out, it did not atone. It did away with the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. And then he adds that Jesus redeemed man not on the cross, but in hell. Now, as soon as a man says the blood did not atone, now anyone who's a true Christian would turn away from such a man. And yet there are multitudes of professing Christians, professing charismatics, following his ministry and supporting it with their finances. Well, they'll certainly have to answer for all that. Are you aware that one of the central doctrines of religious cult teaching is a denial of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ? You can see this in my book entitled Every Wind of Doctrine, where we point out this characteristic of the cults. They deny the blood atonement. So this statement alone from this, quote, charismatic, unquote, minister, stating that the blood of Jesus did not atone should be enough to alert any Bible-believing Christian to the source of such teaching. Even though the JDS teachers make some reference at times to the blood of Jesus, from a seemingly biblical standpoint, nevertheless, they've destroyed the power of Jesus' blood to cleanse from sin by teaching that Jesus became an unholy sacrifice on the cross, that he became literal sin, a sinner, a substitute sinner in hell. Again, was it total identification with sinners by Jesus on the cross, or was it a substitution for sinners? You see, the distinction is very, very important. Now, the JDS ministers confuse identification of Jesus with the human race at his birth with his substitution for sinners on the cross. You see, if he became literal sin and was lost and unregenerate at Calvary, then he would have been an unacceptable offering to God for the sins of others. Whereas if he remained pure and holy, as the scriptures show that he did, then God could accept him as a substitute on behalf of sinners, on our behalf. Only in this way could he fulfill the Old Testament type where the animal for the sin offering had to be spotless and without blemish. Moreover, the sin offering was regarded as most holy to God even after its death. Are you aware of that? We'll cover that later. But in Leviticus 6 and 7, the sin and trespass offerings are most holy to God. Well, this is the general outline of what we'll be discussing in these broadcasts. And you might ask, why should I be concerned about whether Jesus did or did not die spiritually? Well, it's because the Bible shows that your eternal salvation rests upon what you personally believe about the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Doesn't your church teach you that? It's here at the cross, not in the pit of hell, that your salvation either stands or falls. And those who are currently embracing this false doctrine concerning the atonement are guilty of heresy of the most serious kind. Now, its seriousness stems from the fact that if you believe this delusion, then you will find out too late in the end that you've robbed yourself of the blood atonement on your behalf. We will show this, but I trust you can already see this. Now, the Bible is emphatic on this matter. A sinner cannot redeem another sinner, especially if both are lost and in the pit. One would think that this fact is so obvious that you would not need any further explanation, and yet multitudes are following these deluded teachers. The guilty can only be redeemed by someone who is guiltless, and who remains so both during and after the work of redemption. Therefore, in such a case, the guiltless individual could then act as a substitute 
suffering the punishment for which the guilty party was liable. But he could not do so if he himself had become guilty by identifying with sin as the JDS doctrine teaches. In this case, the guiltless who had become guilty by identification could no longer act as an acceptable substitute to God. You see, the main thrust of the entire Old Testament sacrificial system is to show that Jesus was a guiltless substitute who, like the Old Testament type, remained pure and holy both on the cross and after his death. We will show this from Scripture. Next, what constitutes heresy concerning the doctrine of Christ? Now, we've said those who teach that Jesus became a sinner, that he died spiritually, that he had to be born again, and so on, that they are heretics at this point teaching heresy. Now, what constitutes heresy concerning the doctrine of Christ? Well, according to the Bible, heresy with regard to the Son of God is any doctrine or teaching which does not line up with the Word of God, which does not remain true to the doctrine of Christ as set forth in the Word of God. In Second John 7 to 11, we are informed that those who deviate from the biblical teaching concerning Jesus Christ have departed from the truth and they're designated as deceivers. Now, this is such a serious offense to God that we are warned as Christians to avoid these individuals because such deceivers have the spirit of Antichrist. Jot down and read Second John 7 to 11 and you will see this. Here you will see that those who ignore the solemn warning do so to their own peril. Merely to give them greeting makes one a partaker with them of their evil, we're told there. And by implication, such individuals will also partake of their judgment. Now, this passage is not simply to be limited to a test of whether or not one believes in the incarnation of Christ, as, for example, the denial of his eternal deity by the modernists or the religious cults, but it encompasses the entire doctrine of Christ. We read in verse 9, Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. The doctrine of Christ involves everything concerning Jesus Christ as contained in the Word of God. The Old Testament prophecies concerning Him, the Incarnation, the Virgin Birth, His sinless life, His deity, His substitutionary blood atonement, His resurrection, His ascension, the second advent, and on and on. So it should be understood from the outset that the JDS supporters do not adhere to the scriptural doctrine of Christ, but they have grossly perverted it, especially with regard to his blood atonement and to the sinlessness of the Son of God during his period of his time on the cross until his resurrection. And so the seriousness of their departure from the biblical doctrine of Christ is seen in the fact that the JDS doctrine portrays Jesus as unregenerate on the cross and in hell. In hell, he is said to have had to have been born again, providing redemption from the pit. The scriptures, however, prove that Jesus Christ was always sinless and holy, fulfilling the Old Testament type, and that he completed the work of redemption on the cross, not in hell in the pit. On the cross, he declared, it is finished. And at death, he confessed that he was going to his heavenly father, not to hell, and Satan in the pit. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thus the false doctrine of JDS teaching is plainly condemned by the word of God itself. And you should be aware of that fact. In today's broadcast, I want to continue our studies that we began last time based on the question, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? These studies are to expose what I call the JDS heresy. Jesus died spiritually is the teaching, and we will refer to this, this error, this heresy, as JDS, so we don't have to keep repeating, Jesus died spiritually, say teach. But we've shown you in the last broadcast that Jesus did not redeem man in hell, as they teach, but on the cross. And Jesus did not literally become sin on the cross, but a sin offering. Now, the difference is quite important, and you should send for the book and tape list, because these studies are available on cassette tape. Also, my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually?, will give you a detailed study concerning this heresy. Now, today we want to deal with the question, what happened from the cross to the throne? 
We're told by these teachers of this error that Jesus went to hell for three days and there he was unregenerate and Satan was his master and he was unholy and so on. Contrary to what the Word of God teaches about sacrifice, the sin offering, it remained most holy to God, as did Jesus. And he did not go to hell. He said when he died, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Well, all of this will be covered in these studies, and it's in my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? Now, in an attempt to support the erroneous teaching that Jesus went to hell and not to heaven when he died, and that he redeemed sinners while in the pit, the JDS ministers have concocted an imaginary war-in-hell story supposedly based upon Colossians 2.15. Now, the remarkable thing about this story is there's not one shred of evidence in the Scriptures for such a fictional account as they teach, not even in the passage in Colossians that they refer to. Colossians 2.15 reads, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, from this one verse, which refers to the victory of Jesus being accomplished on the cross and not in hell, the war in hell story was invented. And this fantasy is usually related with great emotion by these misty-eyed storytellers, the JDS teachers, while the war in hell narrators are in general agreement on its major aspects, the details of this war in hell theory, this story, seem to vary from one storyteller to another, as some seem to vie with others on the embellishment of the heart-rending scenes which supposedly took place in the pit, which of course there's not one verse or word or shred of evidence in the Bible to support it. A typical war-in-the-pit version of this fairy tale that I've gathered from the literature and recordings of the JDS ministers runs in essence as follows. Now they tell us that Jesus became sin on the cross when he yielded himself to Satan. He swallowed up the evil nature of Satan, thus becoming one in nature with the devil. Jesus became the serpent, lifted up when he was lifted up on the cross. They allegedly get this from John chapter 3. And then he took upon the diabolical nature of Satan himself. And at this point, he was a lost man crying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He has now died spiritually. As we'll show later, he died physically, not spiritually, becoming unregenerate. They go on to say, Upon his physical death, he died twice, we're told, physically and spiritually. His spirit was taken into the pit of hell where he was chained with the fetters of sin and disease and with all the evil of Satan. The devil, we're told, stood before the choir of hell directing the demonic hosts who chorused, We have won, we have conquered the Son of God. And so there followed a great celebration in the pit, inasmuch as Satan now believed he had triumphed over God. However, what he did not know, we're told, is that Jesus, when he became sin and took on Satan's evil nature, was acting as a substitute sinner by identifying as a lost man with them. He was therefore abandoned by God, who was no longer his father, inasmuch as Satan was now his father and master." Jesus suffered agonies beyond description in the pit for three days as all the hosts of hell were upon him. And then suddenly he was justified. From his throne in heaven, we're told, Almighty God arose, put his hands to his mouth and screamed, It is finished, it is enough. Jesus was now born again and made spiritually alive once more. And then we're told that Jesus walked over to the devil, took him by the collar, threw him to the ground, put his foot on his chest, and took from him the keys to death and Hades and the grave. At this juncture, the Holy Spirit kicked open the gates of hell and raised Jesus from death. He then ascended to the Father, after three days, of course, and announced, I have paid the price, the prison is now open. And so it was a born-again man who defeated Satan. Jesus is the firstborn from the spiritually dead, we're told. Thus it was when Jesus was made alive down in the pit that the believer was also made alive with him. The church, we're told, had its origin in the pit of hell when Jesus was begotten from the dead as the firstborn among many brethren.
Is this what actually happened from the cross to the throne? Are you puzzled that you've never read such an amazing account on the pages of your Bible? Then do not be, for the preceding story is fiction from beginning to end. It had its origin not in the Bible, not in the Word of God, but in the fertile imagination of these deluded and gullible JDS teachers. If one cares for the facts without any dramatic embellishment like this, then they're quite simply stated by the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2, 14 and 15. And here he states that the work of redemption was accomplished on the cross, not through some imaginary war-in-hell piece of fiction concocted by the JDS storytellers. In Colossians 2, 14 and 15, Paul states the triumph of Christ over Satan was on the cross. Calvary, he says, resulted in the blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, that is, Satan, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in it, in the cross. In both verses we're informed that the work of redemption was completed on the cross, in the cross. In verse 14, the law which had declared us guilty and demanded our eternal death was removed being figuratively nailed to the cross when Jesus was nailed to the cross and died on our behalf. In verse 15, we're informed that this was also on the cross, not three days later in the pit of hell, that Jesus triumphed over the principalities and powers of Satan's kingdom. Now, this is seen in the apostles' words, triumphing over them in it, or by it. Now, the words in it obviously refer to his cross back in verse 14. Besides the King James Version, other versions also support this view that Christ's triumph was on the cross and not in the pit. Some translate the last part of verse 15 as follows. Other versions, here's another one, And he held them up to open contempt when he celebrated his triumph over them on the cross. Another version, he made a public display of them, that is, the powers of darkness, triumphing over them by the cross. Another version, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. And so we see there's no support for this war in hell theory, where Jesus was unregenerate for three days and Satan was his master, but that Christ, when he died on the cross, said it's finished and went to be with the Father. Now next, we want to give a refutation from Scripture of the basic JDS errors. Remember, JDS stands for the heresy, where they say that Jesus died spiritually. The JDS errors are based upon the contention that Jesus literally became sin with mankind's sinfulness and died spiritually. Now, contrary to JDS teaching, the scriptures clearly show that Jesus remained pure and holy both on the cross and in his death. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without spot and without blemish. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Now, if anyone knows anything at all concerning the typical nature of the Old Testament sacrifices, especially the sin offering, then the erroneous nature of the JDS teaching, which states that Jesus actually became sin, is all too evident. The JDS teachers and their supporters reveal a serious lack of understanding concerning the meaning and nature of the biblical sacrifices. Following the Old Testament type, Jesus did not literally become sin. He was a sin offering. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 should have so been translated. The sin offering was not something sinful, but was most holy to God, and we'll see that in the study which follows. First of all, was Jesus' sin or a sin offering at Calvary? Now, if Jesus literally became sin, as the JDS doctrine teaches, then this would have violated the Old Testament type. The Old Testament animal type, which was to die as a substitute for the sinner, had to be without spot or blemish, according to Leviticus chapter 4 and Deuteronomy 15, 21, also Leviticus 9, 3, 
Now, this requirement, which is stated again and again in the Old Testament, was for the purpose of teaching Israel and the church the lesson, which is apparently lost to the JDS teachers, that a substitute which would be acceptable to God had to be holy and guiltless itself in order to bear the punishment for the guilt of the sinner. Now, this truth was ritually depicted in the Old Testament requirement that the animal substitute be without spot or blemish. And this fact was actually realized in Jesus, the Lamb of God, who offered himself without spot to God. Hebrews 9.14 And so when the JDS teachers insist that Jesus literally became sin and had to be born again, they expose the basic flaw in their heretical doctrine, which stems from their apparent ignorance of the nature of Old Testament sacrifices, especially the sin offering. In addition, as we will show, there seems to be a lack of knowledge of the Hebrew and Greek languages of the Bible, which is also reflected in their erroneous teachings. Now, as the Old Testament clearly shows, at no point did the sin offering ever become sinful, either before, during, or after its death. Now, obviously, this fact is diametrically opposed to the JDS doctrine, which contends that Jesus actually became sin, basing that on an English translation of the Greek 2 Corinthians 5.21. And he took upon himself Satan's evil nature, we're told, and became an unholy sacrifice consigned to hell. Now, in Leviticus 6, 25 to 29, I would encourage you to write that down and read it for yourself. In Leviticus 6, 25 to 29, we are clearly informed that the sin offering was most holy to God both before and after its death. In fact, even after its death, in substitution for the sinner, it remained most holy to God. Only the anointed priest could touch it or eat it, and he could not, of course, touch or eat anything unclean. He was constantly Consecrated. And so it was to be eaten in the holy place of the tabernacle, because it was most holy to God. And moreover, listen to this, anything that touched it became holy in the sight of God also. And so the sacrifice was holy to God from beginning to end. In today's broadcast, we're continuing our teaching based on the question, Did Jesus die spiritually? And we are exposing what we call the JDS heresy. JDS stands for Jesus dying spiritually, which the Bible refutes. Did Jesus redeem man on the cross or in hell? This error says Jesus redeemed us in hell. He became a sinner, a substitute sinner that had to be born again. He was the first to be born again. Did Jesus become sin on the cross literally or a sin offering as the Old Testament type shows? And so we cannot cover all the ground we've covered before. You can send for the book and tape list and get my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? Now the Bible shows he did not, that he died physically. He remained pure and holy in the spiritual sense. So we were dealing at the close of a refutation from Scripture of the basic JDS errors. Now, the reason we're dealing with this somewhat on the radio is because some people will not get the book, and we want them to see that this is a spreading cancer in the body of Christ. In the preceding discussions, we gave the general scope of the JDS heresy, and so they are available to you on cassette tape or from the book. Contrary to J.D.S. teaching, the scriptures clearly show that Jesus remained pure and holy both on the cross and in his death. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Of course, if you know anything at all about the typical nature of Old Testament sacrifice, especially the sin offering, then the JDS error becomes clear. And so we see that Jesus was a sin offering at Calvary, not sin. If Jesus literally became sin, as the JDS doctrine teaches, that would have violated the Old Testament type, the typical nature of the Old Testament sin offering, which remained pure and holy. 
And so the JDS contention that Jesus became a sinner on the cross and had to be born again violates the teaching of the Old Testament as well as the New. For example, in Leviticus 6, 25-29, we're told that the sin offering was most holy to God. In fact, anything who touched it became holy. Speak unto Aaron and to his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest that offers it for sin shall eat it in the holy place. Now, you see, the priest ate the sin offering, so it couldn't be sinful or even symbolized sin. It was an offering for sin. That's why it was pure and holy to God. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall also be holy. All the males among the priests shall eat thereof. It is most holy. Now, nothing could be clearer than the fact that the sin offering, unlike the JDS teaching that it was sinful, the sin offering is most holy to God. Now, it is interesting that the Hebrew term for sin is also the same term for sin offering. In other words... The same term could be translated sin or sin offering, and the context in which it was used would determine whether or not it should be translated as sin or sin offering. We also see that in the New Testament, when in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the King James translators translated that as sin, Jesus became sin for us, they should have translated that as sin offering. Now, I go into much detail in the languages to show you this in my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? So I suggest that you send for that to get a detailed study. The sin offering did not typify something sinful at death to the Jews as the JDS ministers depict Christ, but it typified a sinless sacrifice for sin. And this is precisely the New Testament view concerning the death of Christ, who offered himself without spot to God. Hebrews 9.14 Now, secondly... First of all, we saw that he was a sin offering, not sin. Secondly, is it identification or substitution on the cross? Now, that's important. The JDS teachers contend erroneously that Jesus had to become sin on the cross in order to identify with sinners at all points, that only in this way could he redeem them. Now, this is a gross theological error to say that Jesus had to become sin so he could identify on the cross with sinners. No, his identification with the human race is in his birth, his humanity when he took upon humanity. But on the cross, it's not identification with sin. It is substitution for sin. Again and again, over and over, the New Testament stresses this. So this inaccurate conclusion stems from a lack of understanding concerning the meaning of Old Testament sacrifices. You see, the lesson God was teaching Israel and the church through the sin offering, as well as through all the sacrifices, was the doctrine of substitution, not identification. And this distinction, as I said, is very, very important. Aside from the obvious fact that God's word shows that no sinner could redeem another sinner, that's seen in the Old Testament requirement for the animal substitute to be without spot, as well as the New Testament stress upon the holy, spotless nature of Jesus and his sacrifice, Hebrews 9.14. Aside from that obvious fact, the scriptures do not teach identification with sinners on the cross, but substitution. No acceptable substitute could possibly identify with the sinful, guilty individual he was to redeem. Jesus identified with mankind in his birth when the Son of God took upon himself human nature, but in his sacrificial death he became the sinner's substitute. The scriptures clearly teach that he identified with humanity at his birth in Hebrews 2, 14 to 18. But the scriptures just as clearly show that in his death he substitutes for sinners. He doesn't identify with sinners, he substitutes for them. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Over and over in the New Testament, he died on our behalf. He died in our stead. He died for us. 
It was substitution, not identification at Calvary. It was the just dying for the unjust, 1 Peter 3.18. And while we were sinners, Christ the sinless one died for us. Nothing could be clearer in the New Testament. A sinner on the cross would be dying for his own sins. Thus, Jesus became a sin offering, not sin, in order to fulfill the Old Testament type. The scriptures say he was holy and harmless and undefiled, separate from sinners. Jesus had to identify with our nature. That's why the Son of God took upon himself humanity. But he did not identify with us on the cross. It's substitution. He was not a substitute sinner, as they teach, but a sinner's substitute. And the difference is important. So first of all, we see that he was a sin offering, not sin that he substituted, not identified with us at Calvary. Thirdly, he was righteous, not unrighteous, on the cross as the JDS position teaches. They say that since Jesus became sin on the cross, he was unrighteous until he was born again of all places in the pit of hell. However, Isaiah 53 depicts Jesus on the cross as God's righteous servant who was sent to be our substitute and suffer the punishment due us for our guilt. He is declared to be innocent himself and dying for our transgressions in Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6 and verse 9. He is described in verse 10 as an offering for sin, not sinful, as the JDS heretics assert. He is called by God while on the cross, my righteous servant. And so what a perversion of the biblical truth to call him unrighteous when God says he's righteous while he's dying on the cross. JDS says that he became a sinner on the cross and had to be born again. He's called by God while on the cross, remember, my righteous servant. And then finally in verse 12, God states that while on the cross, Jesus was making intercession for transgressors. Now, how could he do that if he himself were counted as a transgressor? His righteous state on the cross is also seen in the fact that one of the thieves crucified at the time was saved when Jesus was dying on the cross. Now, how could Jesus save a sinner while he was dying on the cross if he himself was a sinner or counted as not righteous? He said to that man, today you'll see me in paradise. And yet JDS teaches that he went three days to hell. Now, who are you going to believe? The JDS teachers of error or Jesus himself who said he was going to the Father when he died and the thief would be with him in paradise? Why didn't he say to the thief, well, in three days you'll go to paradise. Again, in my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually?, I show from the scriptural doctrine of imputation what actually took place on the cross. Now, the JDS teachers state that Jesus actually became sin with our sinfulness and had to be made righteous. But we show that on the basis of the doctrine of the imputation of the guilt of our sin to him, he suffered the punishment of our guilt. He didn't become guilty, or he could not have died on our behalf. We're told, for example, in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. In other words, because of his faith, righteousness was imputed to him. We're told this clearly in Romans 4. And therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now it's not written for his sake alone that righteousness was imputed unto him, that is Abraham, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe. And so through faith in Jesus Christ and his blood atonement, God counts us as righteous by imputing his righteousness to us. He charges Christ's righteousness to our account. And then God treats us as if we had fulfilled his law, Romans 8, 4. Our faith is counted unto us for righteousness, which we do not inherently possess in ourselves. He becomes our righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Now, in the 
the Old Testament, when offering a sin offering, the sinner first laid his hands upon the animal to symbolize the transference of the liability for punishment for the guilt of his sin upon the innocent substitute. Now, obviously, this was not a moral transfer of the actual sin or guilt, but a legal transaction in which the substitute became liable for the punishment of the guilty party. The victim, the substitute, did not become guilty. It was a substitute. It suffered the punishment for the guilty party. And in much the same way, a person who is innocent may assume the legal guilt and liability for punishment for a friend, say, who has violated some traffic law and is unable to pay his penalty or fine. In this case, the person who is innocent himself becomes his substitute and suffers the penalty in his place. Now, the substitute does not become actually guilty. He merely assumes the legal liability for the punishment of the guilty party. And in this sense, the punishment for our guilt was laid upon Christ, our sin offering, our substitute. The prophet Isaiah confirms this, saying, All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. In verse 11, God speaks of him, as we noted previously, as my righteous servant who would bear the punishment for our iniquities. Well, we encourage you to tune in and hear further study about this error, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? I want to continue today our study concerning the question, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? We are exposing the JDS heresy. We call it JDS. This is an abbreviation of the question we're dealing with. Jesus died spiritually, according to some teachers. We've been showing this does not in any way line up with the Word of God. The Scriptures show that Jesus redeemed man on the cross, not in hell, as these people teach. They say he became unregenerate, a sinner on the cross. He became one with sinful humanity there, and in hell he was under the domination of Satan for three days, and then suddenly he was justified in hell by the Father. Now, there's no basis in Scripture for this. The truth is that Jesus was a sin offering on the cross, not sinful. And so we're giving a refutation from Scripture of the basic JDS errors. You can send for the book and tape list and get my book, where I deal with this question, this heresy, in detail. The book is entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? Also, I have a tape by the same title you can get from the book and tape list. And so we have shown already that Jesus became a sin offering on the cross, not sin, that he was a substitute on the cross. They teach that He was identified with humanity in such a way that he became sinful with sinful humanity. But his identification is at his birth when he identified with humanity. It's substitution on the cross. He died on our behalf. And then we showed, too, the scriptures show that he was righteous on the cross, but the JDS teachers say that he was unrighteous. And then, fourthly, on the basis of that error, they say he had to be justified in the pit in hell, whereas the scriptures show that he was the justifier of sinners. The JDS teachers appeal to 1 Timothy 3.16 in their search through the scriptures in an attempt to find a verse here or there, which may use some term, in the English at least, that seems to lend support to their erroneous doctrine that Jesus had to be born again. He was a sinner in hell. Since this verse uses the term was justified in reference to Jesus, in the English translation that is, they have jumped to the conclusion that it must mean that Jesus had to be justified or made righteous from sin. Now, the conclusion is, of course, based upon their own doctrine of the atonement in which their Jesus is sent into the pit, having been made sin, and, of course, they say, possessed with an evil, satanic nature. Now, as such, he had to be made righteous once more, that is, justified and born again. Now, the verse in question, 1 Timothy 3.16, reads, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, speaking of Jesus, and justified 
in the Spirit. Now, anyone who has studied the Greek language of the New Testament is aware that the term translated was justified in this verse means, as the Greek lexicons indicate, to declare as righteous or to show to be righteous. For example, Thayer's Greek lexicon translates this verse in the sense that Jesus was shown to be righteous as to his spiritual nature, the exact opposite to what the JDS teachers imply. Now, anyone who knows the Greek language and the theology of the Bible, the doctrine of justification in Scripture, they know that the term translated as righteousness or to be righteous and so forth never means to make someone righteous or just, but means to announce or declare as righteous or as just. And the Old Testament usage indicates the same thing also. Thus, this verse does not teach that Jesus Christ was made to be righteous. He never ceased to be anything but righteous. But it means he was shown to be righteous, namely by his holy life because of his resurrection from the dead. And because this is the sense of the term, then the translators of several of the versions seek to indicate this fact by translating this verse as follows, that Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit. By the way, remember the King James translation says that he was manifest in the flesh and justified in the Spirit. But that isn't what the Greek says. And so various versions translated as he was vindicated by the Spirit. He was declared righteous in the Spirit. He was pronounced righteous in the Spirit. In the Spirit he was attested as being righteous. Another version states he was proven to be righteous in the Spirit. Another, he was given God's approval in the Spirit. He was proved spotless and pure in his spirit. You see, all of these versions translate the sense of the Greek contrary to what the JDS teachers try to tell us. You know, even if they didn't know Greek or anything about biblical theology, if they would have bothered to have read some of the other translations, they could have at least saved themselves from this inexcusable blunder of teaching that the Son of God had to be justified, or that he was made righteous, and then appealing to a verse that doesn't even teach it in an attempt to prove it. Proof that this verse does not teach that Jesus was made righteous is to be seen in the fact that the same term is used in reference to God the Father in Luke 7, 29 and 30. The account speaks of John the Baptist's message, and all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized by him. Now here we are informed that all those who believed the message of repentance, which John preached, and who were baptized, justified God. Now clearly God does not need to be justified in the sense of being made righteous or just. No, the sense here, just as it is in 1 Timothy 3.16 with reference to the Son of God, is that God the Father is shown or declared to be righteous, that is, right by the people's response to John's message. That is to say, the people who believed and acted on John's message vindicated God, thus witnessing to the fact that he was right or righteous in his declaration that they needed to repent. You see, the JDS doctrine provides no scriptural basis for justification. When one asks the JDS fraternity just how God justified Jesus since he is said to have been made sin with mankind's sinfulness, they can give no scriptural basis at all. Now, without any scriptural support, they state, suddenly God justified Jesus in the pit, and he was born again. Now, one is compelled to wonder if the JDS people have ever really studied the word of God on the doctrines of the atonement, imputation, justification, and so on, inasmuch as their statements on these subjects are so totally out of harmony with the Word of God. You see, the Scriptures show there must be some basis for the justification of a lost, unregenerate individual, and that basis, the Scriptures clearly show in both Old and New Testaments, is the substitutionary blood atonement of Jesus Christ Himself. You see, for centuries, this truth had been emphasized in the Old Testament sacrifices, especially the sin offering. 
and thus God could not just arbitrarily wave his hand over the JDS Jesus in hell and say, Be thou cleansed. And as a consequence, as the JDS people teach, Jesus was suddenly justified, that is, made righteous, born again, and restored to sonship with the Father. There is absolutely no scriptural basis for the Jesus died spiritually error. On the contrary, God himself declares in his word that the soul that sinneth it shall die, Ezekiel 18.20. Again, according to Proverbs 17.15, we are clearly warned, He that justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. That is, he that declares the wicked to be righteous would have no basis for this, and such a whitewashing of the unrighteous is completely opposed to God's method of dealing with sinners are the unrighteous. So contrary to J.D.S. teaching, God requires a sacrifice for sin as a basis for justifying any lost or unregenerate person. And since according to J.D.S. teaching, their Jesus is lost and unregenerate in hell, then where is the basis for his justification? Who died for Jesus? Who died for their Jesus? Who provided an atonement or sin offering for him? You see, an unregenerate sinful Jesus would need a basis for his justification as much as any other lost individual. And so the JDS doctrine provides no basis for their statement that suddenly God justified Jesus. Thus, the confused, unscriptural nature of the JDS doctrine is all too evident to any thinking person. Jesus was not sin, but a holy, righteous sin offering. He was not justified from sin, but his holy sacrifice was the basis for our justification from sin. Again, the JDS teachers insist that God totally abandoned Jesus Christ on the cross, quoting Psalm 22.1, and he was no longer his father, but the devil became his master. Now here I'm going to ask that you send for the book and tape list and get my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually?, Because in that book, for several pages, I give a detailed study of that whole question. Forsaken by God, totally abandoned by God in the sense that Jesus was no longer his son and the devil became his master in hell? No, Jesus' quotation from Psalm 22, 1 saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, does not mean total abandonment by the Father. The implication here is that God had temporarily turned away in that instead of delivering his son from death, which he did on several occasions in the Gospels, the Father delivered him up unto death when he became a sin offering for others. Jesus himself did not believe in the total abandonment delusion while he was on the cross, for he confessed a few hours before his crucifixion, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall all be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. John 16.32 He could say this, because God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5.19 Now how could God be in Christ on the cross if he had totally forsaken him? And so in this one passage alone, we have a scriptural refutation of this error, this heresy, taught by the JDS teachers, saying that Jesus died spiritually, that God totally abandoned him on the cross, he was forsaken by God, that God was no longer his father. Now, the scriptures neither teach nor imply this heresy. And so we have here a clear refutation of the JDS error. Now, in the next broadcast, we're going to be looking at another important question. Did Jesus suffer one or two deaths? The JDS teachers insist that he died both physically and spiritually, but we can show you clearly from the scriptures that Jesus died only physically. In other words, he did not become a sinner and unregenerate because he had died spiritually, but he died only physically. We trust you'll tune in and listen to this lesson. In today's broadcast, I want to continue our study based on the question, Did Jesus die spiritually? We are answering the JDS heresy that says that he did. Did Jesus redeem man on the cross or in hell? 
The Bible shows on the cross, the JDS teachers, JDS standing for Jesus dying spiritually, they say he redeemed man in hell. The church had its beginning in the pit of hell. Did Jesus become sin or a sin offering on the cross? I would recommend that you send for the book and tape list and get my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? I also have one tape on the subject. But the book covers in detail the answer to this heresy, this error. We're giving a refutation from Scripture of the basic JDS errors. We've shown, first of all, that Jesus became a sin offering on the cross, not sin, because the sin offering, as in fulfillment of the Old Testament type, was always most holy unto God. We give clear teaching on this in the book, and we've already given that over the air. We show that he did not identify with sinners on the cross, but substituted for them. He identified with humanity in his birth. That's identification when he took upon himself flesh so that he could die on behalf of sinful man, redeem sinners. But he substituted on the cross, but they teach he became a substitute sinner rather than a sinner's substitute. The JDS teachers also tell us that he was unrighteous on the cross and had to be born again. But according to Isaiah 53 and other passages... God calls him my righteous servant as he dies on the cross. And they teach that he had to be justified from sin, but the scriptures show that he was the justifier of sinners. They teach that he was totally abandoned by God on the cross and that God ceased to be his father, that the devil became his master. And yet we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that God was in Christ on the cross reconciling the world unto himself. How could he totally abandon him if he was in him at Calvary? Now we come today to another error that the JDS teachers tell us, that he died two deaths, both physical and spiritual death on the cross. So another misunderstood term used by the JDS supporters is found in Isaiah 53, 9, where it is said he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. And they cite the fact that the term translated here as death is actually the plural deaths in the Hebrew in this verse. And from this they deduce that Jesus must have died twice, both physically and spiritually. Again, it needs to be pointed out that the teachers of the JDS doctrine have arrived at still another erroneous conclusion, which in this instance stems from their lack of knowledge of the Old Testament Hebrew language and its usage. Now, although the term in the Hebrew in Isaiah 53, 9 is in the plural, deaths, plural, this by no means implies, as the JDS teachers try to contend, that the use of the plural form here denotes some unusual usage, or that we should look for some mystical or profound theological significance, which the form in the singular does not have. On the contrary, as a former teacher of Hebrew and Old Testament in the seminary, I can attest, as anyone knowledgeable in the Hebrew language can, that such plural usages of some Hebrew nouns, when you might expect a singular to occur, it's quite common in the Old Testament. Such plurals quite often do not signify numerical plurality at all. That is to say, the plural deaths allegedly is supposed to signify two deaths here. But such plural nouns are used frequently for emphasis concerning some matter, as in signifying the violent nature of death by crucifixion, or death by fire, or death by the sword, and so on. Now, every Hebrew teacher or grammarian is aware of the frequent usage of such plural nouns in the Hebrew language, and they do not signify numerical plurality at all many times. And so this stresses the importance of possessing a working knowledge of the biblical languages if you're going to present yourself, as the JDS teachers do, as an authority on the subject of the atonement. Obviously, I'm not speaking here of having to acquire an intellectual knowledge about this or that, but of the necessity of being knowledgeable of the Holy Scriptures, the theology, the doctrine, the languages. Now, besides the words in Hebrew, which normally occur in both the singular and the plural forms, that is, man, house, tree, and so on, 
a number of words are used only in the plural and never occur in the singular form in Hebrew usage, such as heavens, waters, and faces, although they are occasionally translated as singular, like in Ecclesiastes 5.2, yet these are plural nouns. They always occur in the plural. The word life is usually plural, for example, also. And, for instance, the Old Testament speaks of one's faces, plural, in reference to the fact that the face has two sides. And so by comprehending such usage of the plural in Hebrew, the reader will be able to understand better other unique uses of the plural noun in the Hebrew language, such as the use of the plural noun deaths in Isaiah 53.9. And as a result, you can understand why the use of the plural in this verse does not mean two deaths, but is used in the plural for emphasis. Therefore, some words are used in the Hebrew language not to express the idea of numerical plural Plurality, when used in the plural form, but are used to denote such concepts as intensity, such as a violent death, majesty in reference to God as king, magnitude with reference to greatness, our excellence, our virtue, our amplification, and so on. For example, where in English one would use an adjective to express the magnitude of something, such as abundant blessing or thick darkness, the same idea is often conveyed in the Hebrew by the use of a plural noun without an adjective. Thus, in Hebrew, the idea of abundant blessing can be expressed merely by the use of the plural noun blessings, as in Psalm 21.6. Now, this is designated as a plural of magnitude. Now, in my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually?, I give many, many examples out of the Hebrew Old Testament, out of the Hebrew language, which show plurals to be other than numerical plurals, that is meaning two or three or whatever, like plurals of majesty and plurals of rank, plurals of magnitude, plurals of intensity, concerning various things like wrath and reproach and death and darkness. Take, for example, the matter of death. When used of a single individual's death, as in Isaiah 53, 9 and Ezekiel 28, verses 8 to 10, the plural noun, deaths, is used to express the idea of intense or violent death. Now, this usage is to contrast such an experience with that of a normal death in which the singular form death would have been used to refer to the demise of but one individual. And so the plural of intensity is used to express vicious and violent death, such as a death so painful and extreme, like death by the sword, fire, or crucifixion, that it's like dying repeatedly, thus the use of the plural noun deaths. Now, this is common knowledge to anyone who knows Hebrew. Further evidence that the plural deaths does not mean that the person died twice when this form is used to denote the death of but one individual is seen in the use of the plural deaths to describe the violent death of still another person in the Old Testament, the king of Tyre. In Ezekiel 28, 8-10, the King James Version actually translates the Hebrew literally in this passage as the plural deaths and singular in Isaiah 53. Of course, there's no consistency in many translations. But addressing himself to the king of Tyre, God foretells his violent death, saying, that they shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths, plural, of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. And then God says, Thou shalt die the deaths, plural, of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. You see, the plural of intensity is used in this passage to describe the king's violent death, just as it is in Isaiah 53, 9, in reference to the death of Christ by crucifixion. Now, obviously, there's no suggestion in Ezekiel 28 that the king of Tyre will die more than once, like the JDS teachers say of Christ. This passage in Ezekiel 28 does not imply he's going to die both physically and spiritually. 
The JDS teachers need to explain why it is that they do not refer to this passage in Ezekiel also, inasmuch as the plural deaths is used here of just one single individual, just as it is in Isaiah 53, 9. The JDS teachers do not refer to this passage either because they didn't realize it was in the Bible or because it would expose their false doctrine that asserts that Jesus died twice, which teaching they base upon the use of the plural noun deaths in Isaiah 53, 9. Now, no Hebrew student, no Hebrew grammarian would make such a blunder over the use of the plural nouns in the Hebrew language. For example, here's what one Hebrew grammar states concerning such use of the plural. Such usage of the plural expresses an intensification of the idea of the singular. That's what we've been saying. The nouns of intensity are in the plural, but they do not signify many times numerical plurality. And so again, I suggest you send for the book and tape list and get my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? And there we give much detailed study showing that the use of the plural deaths in Isaiah 53, 9 does not signify he died both physically and spiritually. Which brings us to that question, did his death at Calvary signify physical or spiritual death? We've already shown it can't be both. Now, it may surprise you that the Bible again and again speaks of his death, but it's always in physical terms, never once spiritually. In the teaching that Jesus died spiritually as well as physically, in order to have Jesus identify with sinners who were spiritually dead, we find that the JDS position is out of line with the Word of God. The Bible again and again states that Jesus offered up his body as a sacrifice for sins and that he was put to death in the flesh. Not once do the scriptures state that Jesus died in his spirit. On the contrary, notice the passages that state he died in his body, died physically. Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, 1 Peter 2.24, being put to death in his flesh, according to 1 Peter 3.8. For as much then as Christ suffered for us in the flesh, 1 Peter 4.1. And you has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through his death. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Again, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. John 6, 51. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Hebrews 10, 10. Again, in Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Now, in addition to these clear texts which indicate that the sacrifice of Jesus constituted the offering of his body of flesh, there are others, like when Jesus said to the opposing religious leaders, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. We are informed that he spake of the temple of his body, John chapter 2. Today, I want to give a concluding study concerning the question, did Jesus die spiritually? We are exposing in these teachings the JDS heresy. JDS stands for Jesus died spiritually, which some charismatics and non-charismatics for that matter are erroneously teaching. They teach that Jesus redeemed man in hell instead of on the cross, that Jesus became sin on the cross rather than a sin offering. Now, we've given you in the past broadcasts a refutation from Scripture of the basic JDS errors, such as saying he became sin on the cross instead of a sin offering, that he identified with sinners, became a substitute sinner on the cross, whereas the Bible teaches he became the sinner's substitute, that is, he died on our behalf. They teach that he became unrighteous on the cross, and yet the Bible shows, as God says in Isaiah 53, that he was his righteous servant on the cross making intercession for sinners. Again, the JDS teachers tell us he had to be justified on the cross, whereas we see he is the justifier of sinners. We're told he was totally abandoned by God on the cross, whereas 2 Corinthians 5 states that God was in Christ on the cross, reconciling the world unto himself. 
we showed how that although the plural deaths are used in Isaiah 53, 9, we've shown you from Hebrew usage that this signifies a violent, vicious, intense kind of death when the plural is used and it doesn't signify two deaths as the JDS teachers insist that he died both physically and spiritually. And then it was shown that Again and again, when the scriptures speak of his death, it's always the offering up of his body, the death of his body. He died in the flesh. It's never once said he died in the spirit. Now, all of that teaching is available to you in my book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? You can send for that book and get a detailed study which answers the JDS heresy. Now, on this final study, was redemption in hell or on the cross? Was his work finished or unfinished at Calvary? Once more, it's evident that the JDS teaching is at variance with the Bible, inasmuch as the words of Jesus from the cross are contradicted by those who contend that Jesus died spiritually. Several of his utterances at Calvary would have to be ignored or reinterpreted in order to accept the JDS doctrine. In the first place, the promise of Jesus to the repentant thief when he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise is contradicted by the JDS teachers who insist that Jesus didn't go to paradise that day but went to hell for three days, not to heaven. Secondly, when Jesus declared as he died, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, the clear implication is that his spirit went to be with the Father in heaven, while his body was three days in the sepulcher. But the JDS teaching contradicts this and asserts that when Jesus died, he gave his spirit into the hands of Satan, who became his master, and that Jesus was united in spirit with his adversary. Now, if the words of Jesus cannot be relied upon to mean what he clearly is saying, then why do the JDS supporters believe that they can rely on anything that Jesus said, such as his promise of eternal life or the resurrection from the dead? Thirdly, we are informed by these erroneous teachers that when Jesus said, while on the cross it is finished, he did not mean, we're told, that he had finished the work of redemption at Calvary. On the contrary, they tell us this work was only beginning. Jesus redeemed sinners in hell, whereas sin he suffered as their substitute sinner. Now, the JDS doctrine asserts that when he said it is finished, that this does not mean what most Christians think that it does. Jesus was merely referring to the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant as an Israelite. Furthermore, they tell us that Jesus' blood did not atone for sin, and that his sacrifice constituted the last sacrifice under the old covenant. Well, the reason they tell us that is such an interpretation is required by them to support their doctrine that he redeemed us in hell and not on the cross. Was it finished or unfinished at Calvary? Well, in an attempt to overcome the insurmountable problem which the JDS teachers are confronted with by Jesus' own words to the thief when he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, they've resorted to a dishonest manipulation of his words and to the substitution of their own ideas for the obvious meaning of his statement. Now, they do this because they've placed Christ in hell for three days as unregenerate until he's born again, citing Psalm 16.10 and Acts 2.31 from the King James Version. In this translation, Acts 2.31 reads, His soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did seek corruption. Now, on the basis of this English translation, and it's translated incorrectly, they teach that Jesus went to hell for three days, that he was born again in the pit of hell, and so on. Now, one would think that even if they didn't understand the term translated hell in the Old Testament is incorrectly translated in the King James Version in Psalm 1610, just as it's also incorrectly translated from the Greek in Acts 2.31 as hell, at least some of the other versions should have informed them of this fact. You see, the term translated hell in Psalm 1610 should have been rendered as Sheol, while the term hell in Acts 2.31 is the Greek word Hades and should have been rendered that way. Now, in both instances, the term Sheol and Hades have essentially the same meaning, the place of departed spirits. Now, this is seen in the fact that the term Hades in Acts 2.31 translates the term Sheol in Psalm 1610. 
Thus, when the Messiah, in Psalm 16.10, quoted in Acts 2.31 by Peter, when the Messiah says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in Sheol, he meant that God would not allow him to remain in the realm of the dead or the departed spirits, not that he was going to hell as unregenerate, as the JDS teachers tell us. Moreover, just as to where he was actually going in the realm of the departed spirits when he died on the cross, he clearly tells us that he was going in spirit to the Father in paradise. This is plain enough from his utterances on the cross, saying to the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today, when he said it is finished, that is finished on the cross, not three days later in hell. And thirdly, when he said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. In spite of his clear statements that his work of redemption was finished on the cross and that he was going to the Father in paradise, the JDS teachers insist on sending Jesus to hell for three days. You see, the English term hell should only be used to translate, as most versions do, the Greek term Gehenna, like in Mark 9.43, which is equivalent to the lake of fire in Revelation 20. The notion that Christ went to hell at his death, and by the way, hell is the final abode of the wicked, and at present they go to Hades, that is the wicked, in that part of Hades where they are kept under bonds and punishment. The notion that Christ went to hell at death is generally derived from a late form of the so-called Apostles' Creed, which, of course, was not composed by the Apostles. This later version of the Creed states that Christ at death descended into hell the third day he rose from the dead. However, the earlier and shorter form of the creed did not contain that statement, he descended into hell, as well as some other statements found in the later form of the creed. These were added at various times later over the centuries. Now, in spite of all of this evidence we've given you, Yet the JDS teachers insist on placing Jesus in hell with Satan as his master for three days. We are informed that he gave himself into Satan's hands without resistance. Now try, if you can, to reconcile that teaching with Jesus' own words in John 14.30, just a few hours before his crucifixion, when he declared, The prince of this world cometh, but he has nothing in me. Now the choice is clear. One must either take the words of Jesus here, as well as those from the cross when he said it is finished, and that it was going the same day in spirit to his Father in paradise, or take the contradictory JDS doctrine, since the two can never be reconciled. Now, deluded men may place Jesus in hell for three days, but Jesus made it absolutely clear, not only from the cross, but on several other occasions, that on his departure from this world, he was going directly to his Father in heaven, not hell. For example, in John 13, 1, we are informed, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Now notice, depart out of this world unto the Father. He's not going to make a three-day layover in the pit while he becomes a sinner and has to be born again. In every instance, departing out of this world by Jesus is to go back to the Father. Now, in order to make his point clear as to just where he was going, when he left this world at his death, he repeated his destination several times, saying, I go to the Father, I go to the Father, I go back to the Father. Note this in John 14, 12, and in verse 28, in chapter 16, 10, in verses 16 and 17 and 28. Now, this fact is repeated twice more from the cross, once in his promise to the thief that today he would be with him in paradise, and in his declaration, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, these statements, all made within the time context of the crucifixion, constitute no less than nine times that his destination is clearly stated to be heaven and not hell. Nevertheless, as if he'd never said it once, the JDS teachers insist on sending Jesus to hell for three days. Now, evidence that Jesus completed redemption on the cross and not in the pit is to be found also in John 19.28, where we are informed that when Jesus knew that all things were now a Accomplished, that is, his work of redemption was completed, he then said, It is finished. John 19 and verse 30. 
Now, it should be evident from this, as well as from the foregoing study that we've given you, that the JDS doctrine is another gospel, Galatians 1, presenting another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11. When the JDS doctrine is compared with Scripture, one is constrained to lament with Mary as she stood before the sepulcher, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Now again, I invite you to send for the book and tape list. The address is given at the close of this broadcast. And get this book entitled, Did Jesus Die Spiritually? Because this is an end-time error, deception, and heresy that's running rampant through charismatic as well as non-charismatic circles. And you see, my friends, if you do not have a biblical view of the atonement, then you are jeopardizing your salvation because what you believe about the atoning work of Jesus has its consequence with whether or not you're going to be saved or unsaved. Saved. And these heretics teach that the blood of Jesus does not atone, that Jesus became a sinner on the cross, unregenerate, that he had to be born again, and a child ought to be able to see that if he became a sinner, he cannot redeem sinners. You don't redeem sinners in the pit, but you redeem sinners, as the Bible shows, as a holy, pure, spotless sacrifice on the cross. You see, Jesus had to remain holy and pure on the cross in his death and thereafter in order to redeem man and in order to fulfill the Old Testament type. Remember, as we've shown you, the sin offering is called most holy to God. No one could touch it but the consecrated priests, and they were to eat it, and they could not eat anything unclean or sinful. It was most holy to God. 